Hi everyone, thanks for joining today's webinar where, where we'll be talking about implementing ROAR. Uh, we have uh, quite some people on the line, so you'll find that you're muted. Uh, we do, of course, welcome questions, but if you have questions, please use the chat or the Q&A. Uh, we won't be answering any questions during the presentations, but afterwards there will be plenty of time to answer all the questions you may have. Um, you may also see that I've switched on the recording, um, so this webinar will be recorded and we'll make it available afterwards through our YouTube channel. So if we look at today's agenda, on the next slide, um, I will first start with a brief introduction um, of ROAR. And then uh, we'll hear from today's guest speaker, uh, Daniela Loenberg, who is um, Dryad's product manager. And after that, Robin Dessler, data sites product manager, um, will talk about war in the data site metadata schema. And as I said, after that, we'll have plenty of time uh, for all of your questions. So briefly about ROAR. Um, I think most of you probably know what ROAR is, uh, and that's why you're here. But I think if you don't know what ROAR is, probably the next two talks will be very confusing. So I thought it would be useful to start with a very brief overview. So ROAR stands for Research Organization Registry, which basically means that we've created a registry that contains unique persistent identifiers for research organizations. If we go to the next slide, what, I think you need to go one back. Thank you. Uh, what makes ROAR unique um, is not specifically that it provides unique identifiers for research organizations, because there are some other solutions out there. But what makes it unique is that it's a community-led project and that we're developing an open registry uh, that everyone can use. Um, so the project partners are Crossref, DataSite and CDL. Uh, with help from Digital Science, um, who contributed their grid database. Uh, but it's not just these organizations working on war. It's really a community initiative. So we have a large group of community advisors. And if you look at war.org slash community, you can see all the organizations that are already involved in war and are advising us where to go with war. Now, in January, we launched uh, the war MVR, the Minimum Viable Registry. Uh, and that basically means that ROAR is ready to use and also ready uh, for use by you. And that's in a way also really what we want to show you today, that ROAR can be used. And I hope that uh, these two implementation examples you'll see today will inspire you to think about how you can use and implement ROAR for your organization. So I'd like to hand over to Daniela, who will talk about Roaring at Dryad. Thanks, Helena. Um, thanks for having me at this webinar. And for those uh, that don't know me, my name is Daniela Lohenberg. I'm a, the Dryad product manager, and I also work on the Make Data Count project with DataSite. Um, and for those who don't know Dryad, uh, Dryad is a general data repository that provides curation for each data set. Um, and we have about 30,000 data sets in Dryad now. Um, and I just wanted to kind of give an overview of the backstory on why we implemented ROAR and then how we did and how others can do it similarly. Uh, but being, uh, if you go back, sorry. <laughs> um, the reason that we went in for an early implementation on this is kind of twofold, but uh, since we were a nimble platform and getting ready to relaunch Dryad, uh, which happened a couple of weeks ago, we wanted to make sure that we were putting in best practice and standard PIDs for each of the portions of the data set. And the one thing that was really standing out was institutions. Next slide. But to go back in time, Ted Haberman, who's on this call right now, created this slide. Um, he and I had been working together with the Dryad organization to figure out how we could find the ROARs for the last 28,000 data sets that were in Dryad. So Dryad had that many data sets, but hadn't asked authors for affiliations because when Dryad started 10 years ago, um, it just was the beginning really of this data publishing and understanding what the needs were. 
So we don't, A, didn't have any affiliations for the authors, which is about 90,000 authors. And then B, even if we could find the affiliations, we couldn't really say that they were standard across the board. And so what Ted had been embarking on um, is taking these Dryad DOIs, everything in Dryad uh, up before this relaunch, always had an associated article. And so we went to the Crossref uh, API and were able to pull the related article metadata for which we found about half of those had author affiliations. Then we had to go directly to other journals like PLOS that had open APIs and pull the affiliations for those related articles there. And then there was about maybe 10,000 DOIs of data sets where we are manually looking up and try and find other ways to scrape and get the affiliations. When I say the affiliations and where Ted had said that in the arrow there, what we really mean is just whatever the author had written in. And so Ted came up with a process here um, where he actually was able to use the reconciler, look for specific tokens of an affiliation name, and shoot out a roar. And so what we were able to do is actually find about 11,000 of the data sets that we've put into the new dryad that were migrated over actually do have roars for at least a couple of their authors on each data set now. And so that's kind of a similar process to the new system in that it needs to end to go back to data site and update all those records. Next slide. But for the actual thinking about everything that's coming into Dryad in the new, we wanted to put Roar in to make sure that we didn't fall into this problem again. So of course we had a, a new field for affiliations, but it wouldn't really help us much to just have a field for affiliations that wasn't standard if we'd have to go back and clean this up again. And so we went through a couple of steps here to implement it that I'm gonna go through, but some of the facets here are on the submission interface for the researcher, calling the Roar API, storing the name, sending it to data site, and some of those challenges that we found. Next slide. So this is an animation that Maria Gould, who works on the Roar project, has made. Um, and what it shows is an image of the Dryad dataset submission page. And so here where it says institutional affiliation, what we're actually doing is calling the Roar API and then auto-populating the dropdown here. And I'm gonna come back to this in a little bit when we talk about challenges, but since we've launched, we found that this has been wildly successful in actually finding the roar for each of the authors. Um, we do allow people to overwrite this and write something else in because there is a possibility that roar doesn't have every single affiliation since we're global in scope that we hope, um, I don't know what the percent the roar folks would be able to say um, that we're able to capture with this. Next slide. So after each author puts it in, we wanna store this in the database. And so we're actually storing the long name of the ROAR, so the actual ROAR name, and then the ROAR ID. And so this is something that we wouldn't say ever is researcher facing. We don't write about this in the submission form. We don't talk about this with the researchers who are submitting, but in the back, we're actually storing this so that we can eventually send it over to data site. Next slide. And so when we're displaying it, we're just displaying the ROAR name. And so um, we display ORCID as well, but it really shouldn't be anything different. We don't think that we're displaying here that it's just each of these names is a ROAR. We know the ROAR ID for each one. And this way, when we send it out to data site, and if someone wanted to go to the Dryad API um, and download all of this, we know that they could get these right standardized affiliations for each new author. Next slide. So um, assuming that these slides are gonna be circulated, I'm not assuming anyone is gonna copy these down. I've put in the three links to our code in here uh, for how we actually implemented it. So the service that talks to the Roar API on the top is when you type in, start typing in your affiliation and you get that Roar, uh, the option dropdown. Um, then there's the HTML page with the type ed functionality if you want to implement that. Um, and then the user requests would be the last part. So the first part is the only part that is um, some of the UI. Um, but we are happy to have our developers um, set up a call with yours to talk about how we did this. Um, it only took a couple of days to implement and it should take less if anyone wants to use our code because a lot of it was writing. Next slide. 
So I wish that by this webinar, we were able to be absolutely stellar and say that we were sending all of this to data site, but um, in the midst of launching, we realized we had to upgrade the schema to 4.3, which I know Robin's about to talk about, um, but it is on our very close roadmap in the next couple of weeks to get this going, to be able to send all of the ROARs that we're storing, both from the migrated data sets in the back, and then also any new submission over to data site in the metadata. Next slide. And I wanted to kind of close, although we've been, if not super positive, to say that um, we do foresee a couple of challenges with this, um, which may be not even specific to ROAR, but maybe PIDs in general. Um, of course, there's a possibility that we won't have a ROAR available for every author. Um, and so Dryad has curators that go through every submission. So we're looking at ways that we can flag for the curators anytime the data set has an author that didn't put in a ROAR. That way we can have a feedback loop to be able to write to uh, ROAR the team and be able to get some of these added. There's also a possibility that people could put in the wrong ROAR. And so we could um, have this, this problem where um, they meant to click something else or you uh, type in your institution and then you see one that sounds kind of similar, um, but it may not actually be the exact um, and then there's, uh, of course, we've seen a couple of times where people have maybe typed really fast or um, other reasons that they put, they evade putting in a ROAR, but we actually know a ROAR exists. And so a lot of this relies on us having curation. And we want to think about how we can kind of scale this and give a lot of feedback back to the ROAR project so that repositories who aren't curating would have um, a better interface to be able to work with this, um, especially thinking about the search results. Um, when I had said that on that animation that Maria had made of typing Queens University, the um, the right one was actually the third option. And so we're noticing that in some of these cases, um, the right option can come up as the 20th in that list and things like that. So uh, we wanna work with the ROAR team to figure out how we can better call the API to get the best results in these searches. But um, in the last two or three weeks since we've been live with Dryad, we've had uh, hundreds of submissions with these ROARs being added without real problems except for these potential challenges that we foresee. And we're uh, really excited for others to be able to join in and do the same and hear about their experiences. So. Please get in touch if you have questions and thanks DataSite for having me. Yeah, thanks a lot, Daniela. That was really great to see this example. Um, as I said, we'll be taking questions uh, at the end, but please feel free to already start putting your questions for Daniela in chat. Then she can already start thinking about the answers and then uh, we'll discuss them after Robin's presentation. Um, so yeah, Robin, over to you. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, yes, so hello, I'm Robin Dassler, the product manager for DataSite, as Helena mentioned in the beginning. And so my piece of this is going to be talking about um, how DataSite included uh, updates that help support ROAR uh, in our most recent metadata schema update, because it doesn't really help if we have these identifiers, if you can't actually uh, submit them to us and actually have that mean something. So we've recently made some updates that should make this a little bit better. So first, a little bit about data site metadata schema 4.3. Um, so this was released on August 16th of this year. Um, and as usual with all of our schema versions, uh, all the information for the current schema version and all past versions, um, as well as uh, the official documentation for how to use this, uh, which includes things like the controlled vocabulary lists and all of this, uh, can be found at our dedicated schema site, uh, which is schema.datasite.org. And so let me tell you a little bit about the kind of things we have, we have changed in 4.3. So one thing that is new for 4.3 is the support for affiliations. Um, so we added some new sub properties for affiliations to the creator and contributor properties. Previously in the data site schema, uh, we, we had creator and contributor properties and you could add um, identifiers for the actual people in there, but we didn't actually have a field in which you could include um, any kind of identifiers for affiliations. And so now we have added those. Um, so these include the affiliation identifier. This is the actual identifier as a URL. Uh, the affiliation identifier scheme. This doesn't have to be a ROAR. Uh, we certainly like ROAR, but you could use GRID or ISNI or whatever other affiliation identifier scheme you may want to use. Um, and then of course the scheme URI, so where the, the scheme is actually uh, located. 
Um, one thing we have updated also is um, we've extended some additional uh, information for our funding reference property. Our, our funding reference property did already support identifiers for funders, largely because of the uh, Crossref funder registry. But in 4.3, we've explicitly added a ROAR to the list of controlled values for the funder identifier type subproperty. So now you can also submit a ROAR for a funder. Um, and we've added a new subproperty for the scheme URI uh, to again support where the scheme is actually located. Um, and you can have multiple um, identifiers for an item. So if a funder has both a, uh, a um, ROAR or a Crossref funder ID, you can include both of those and similar things for, for authors. Um, uh, author identifiers and author affiliations. And just as a brief reminder, um, we also allow name identifiers, as I mentioned, for creators. Um, in the case of a human, this is usually an ORCID, but for an organization or an institution, or in some cases people call this a corporate author, um, this can be a ROAR. So for anything that's actually an, an entity of some kind that's not a human being that is being credited with creating a data set, um, you can actually use the ROAR for the name identifier. And in our Fabrica web interface for creating DOIs, uh, we have implemented a ROAR lookup for organizational creators. Uh, so when you're entering a creator that is not a person, uh, you can do the same kind of thing like Dryad did, where you can look up uh, in the ROAR uh, database uh, the actual ID for that particular creator. So just to throw some code up on the screen. <laughs> I'm going to show you a little bit about ROAR in action. So this is an example of the XML. So this would show you, for instance, how to add an affiliation for a person. So you can see kind of at the, at the bottom there of the, of the creator package, there is a, a section about adding the affiliation identifier. Uh, so you would add the actual ROAR and you would name it and you could submit this to us. And just as a reminder, um, we accept XML either in the uh, file upload section of Fabrica or those of you who are using the NBS API are most likely uh, can submit things in XML. And so this is the kind of thing that you would submit uh, when you are submitting stuff through our API. However, as a brief reminder, we do also now have uh, our, our fancy new version two of our REST API. And our REST API is all JSON. Um, and so that you can actually submit all of this information as JSON as well. You can do your whole metadata package as JSON if you're using the REST API. Um, and so this is, this is how you would do that if you are submitting this. Uh, you can submit multiple affiliations, of course, for a person, and it would be the same, the same kind of concept where you include the ROAR ID and the affiliation name and all of this stuff. So in Fabrica, just to show you a little bit about some of the things that I mentioned, this is an example of adding the uh, ROAR ID for an organizational creator, as I said. So you can see in the animation when you uh, select the radio button that says the creator is an organization instead of a person, then the uh, name identifier that you're looking for is a ROAR. So you can uh, paste in a ROAR ID and the name autofills. So you can do it. It's a little bit opposite of what Dryad has, but you can uh, put it in that way. So this way we make sure that the names are standardized um, in, in the way that they're submitted through our metadata. Um, and then in Fabrica, this is another example of ROAR IDs for a person. And in this case, we do have it similar to how Dryad is, where we can have the, the actual lookup uh, by the text. So in this case, I'm entering my own name and I am searching for data site as an affiliation. And when I select it, it auto populates the ROAR. And so this way we can submit the ROAR for the affiliation for a human being as well. Um, okay, so I just want to spend a little bit of time at the end here to talk about, so what? Why does anybody actually care about this ROAR thing? What does it mean for you? Uh, what does this mean that we can actually solve with this? Um, what is the point of submitting any of this stuff to data site? So there's kind of a use case that we've been trying to solve. And this use case is as a university administrator or repository manager or anyone else is interested in this kind of thing, uh, I want to get a list of all data sets and software published by our researchers so that I can get a comprehensive view of our research outputs. And this could be anything that, uh, that a data site DOI describes, whether it's data site, software, uh, white papers, and these other kind of thing. Um, and this has been a problem that has been unnecessarily hard for too long. This sounds like a relatively easy thing to solve, but it has been a bit difficult. And primarily this has been because we couldn't definitively say who these so-called our researchers actually were because of the way people put in uh, way people enter in different uh, not matching names or um, the way maybe we don't know certain uh, names are associated with the particular entity and all this. So just defining who our researchers actually are has been unnecessarily difficult for too long. 
So what ROAR actually helps you do, uh, ROAR then definitively identifies your institution, no matter how many names it has. So you can make sure that all of your authors are affiliated with the right place. And so the idea of having a specific identifier that identifies an institution rather than just entering the name is that you know you are linking to the same institution that is uniquely identified no matter what name someone would normally have put in as their affiliation just in a free text field when they're submitting an article and etc. And so what, what we really see this, we see this as a key component of this concept of the PID graph that some of you may have heard from some of our other webinars um, that really helps us link all this stuff together. So now that we've definitively identified your institution with Aurora, we can just kind of insert that whole little package into this PID graph. We plug that in and then we can let the power of PIDs connect all the research outputs to your institution. So by knowing definitively that someone is associated with your institution, we can then in turn, through the power of all these connected PIDs, know that their publications are then associated to them, which are then associated to your institution. And so what does this actually mean for you? So this particular use case we were trying to solve, please show me all of the information that my authors have, have created uh, and please show it to me now. This has been very hard to solve for all this time. And now here is an example of using our GraphQL API to do it in 40 seconds. And this is actually me typing this in. So pardon me, bad typing. It might've actually been shorter, except I had to go back and remember where some of the brackets actually go as is commonly a problem. But here you can see I'm identifying a particular organization and I'm asking the GraphQL interface, in this particular visual interface to give me the name of that organization the total count of all the data sets that are associated with it, and then to please show me the ID and the title of each of those data sets. And once that is finished, I run it, it thinks, and there you go, and there it is. That particular group had, one, had 109 data sets, so they're kind of an early adopter of some of these. Uh, yes, and so that is what Roar can do for you. And so that is all we had today, and we will now welcome your questions, and I'll turn it back over to Helena to, to wrangle the questions. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Robin. It was really nice to see an example of what you, of the kinds of questions you can now answer using Roar. Um, so I've already seen some questions come in, so let me go back to the first question that came in at the end of Daniela's talk. Um, that question was, my screen is moving now. Is it a best practice to go back and update all the records that use an earlier version of the data site standard to the latest one? Um, well, I guess in a way that is a question for both Daniela and Robin. So maybe to start with Daniela. Daniela, would you welcome it if researchers using Dryad go back and update their Dryad um, outputs? I was wondering if the question was more about, are we doing the wrong thing or the right thing? Oh. <laughs> um, going back and updating the ROARs for the former researchers who submitted. And so I would say I point that back to data site. Maybe you guys can shame us or tell us it's okay. <laughs> but I mean, but I think, yeah, I, I agree. That's part of the question. But are researchers... Those records and update that information, I guess, still for Daniela. Oh, it seems we temporarily lost her. So then in that case, let's move to Robin first. Uh, yes, and, and from my side, you cut out for a little bit, but I think I, I, think I followed the gist of the question. Um, oh, so good. yes, uh, from, I mean, from the data side perspective, as we, as we update the, the schema to newer versions, it is usually to add additional, uh, the possibilities of additional metadata. And so we certainly do not mind in principle having those records be updated uh, to include additional metadata because we are clearly making the schema updates because we are interested in, in gathering that additional metadata. Um, so I think the question of whether or not to, uh, how to handle that based on uh, information that people may or may not have entered at a particular given time several years ago, I think is up to the individual repository, but we certainly, yeah, we certainly would think that is, is nice to have that metadata, yes. So we would recommend that as a yes, as, as yeah, a, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, excellent. Um, so next question that came in: <clears throat> In the UK, it's fairly common for high-flying researchers to be headhunted by rival institutions, especially when a research excellence framework exercise is looming. 
how does Roar handle researchers changing affiliation or indeed having multiple simultaneous affiliations? Um, well, maybe that's actually a, a question for Roar's product manager, who fortunately we have on the line as well. So Maria, I don't know if you maybe want to comment here. I can see Maria unmuted, but. Okay, maybe we move to the next question for now. How does Roar handle organizations that can be considered sub-organizations of a larger organization. Ah, Maria saying, sorry, not sure my sound is working. She will type an answer in chat. So let's go back to some of the other questions. Okay. In Dryad, what happens when authors want to enter a department as part of the organization? Will the overall organization be extracted or a new role created for each department sub-organization? So Daniela, maybe you can say something about that. Yeah, I think it's a question larger about Roar than it is about Dryad, really. Um, and I, I've heard Maria say it enough, so she can correct me if I'm wrong, but um, ROAR is at the institutional level and not at the department level. Um, and I think the ROAR project knows that it's a need, but right now it's really not about sub-organizations and it's about having a, a, a identifier for the top level institution. And so because that's ROAR scope, that's what we've put in. We've considered adding other fields in Dryad to get departmental affiliations, but they would not be standardized. Thanks, Maria. Hi, this is Maria. <laughs> can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Thanks for uh, for joining uh, again. Do you? Uh... Oh, great. I'm so sorry about the audio difficulties. Um, hi, everyone. This is Maria Gould. Uh, I'm at California Digital Library. I'm the project lead for Roar. And um, now that I have my mic working, I can address a couple of the questions that just came in, <laughs> in case it's helpful. Uh, so. Uh, going back to what Daniela was just talking about, um, thank you for, for covering there. Um, that, is, that is correct, that Roar is really focused on, on being a, a, a truly open registry um, focused on you know, top level organizations. Um, that being said, uh, we know that um, there are a lot of people interested in identifying affiliations at the department level. Um, there are some uh, some groups within our community advisory board who are kind of um, running their own mini project um, to see if they can build some sort of ROAR extension or department extension that could connect to ROAR. Um, but that's really kind of out of scope for, um, for the focus of our project right now is we want to really be able to identify organizations at that basic um, top level affiliation level and then make sure that the registry is open and interoperable so that other kinds of identifiers can hook into it. Uh, the, um, we are going to be adding some, some basic uh, relationships in our metadata, however, for cases in which we have a primary university system, for example, University of California, um, to be able to identify that in the war metadata as a parent um, and a campus like University of California, Berkeley as a child. So uh, we're not going below the primary organization to departments and organized research units, but we will have some basic relationships in the metadata um, to show parent, child, and related records. Um, so I hope that, that answers that question. Um, I'm going to go back and then I'll turn it back to you, Helena, um, but happy to field more to the first question about multiple affiliations. I think that that's, uh, it might be helpful to think about that as um, in the case that's being described here where researchers have um, changed an affiliation or having multiple affiliations. Uh, the thing that I would frame this around is that ROAR IDs are for institutions. And so 
they're not they're not for researchers um, they're for institutions and so the ID for that institution is not going to change uh, and it's kind of going to be incumbent upon um, you know other kinds of other kinds of systems and PIDs that connect into ROAR to kind of address how those changes are reflected over time. Uh, for instance, I know that ORCID is planning to support ROAR IDs uh, and they're doing a lot of work right now to show, uh, you know, how ORCID profiles change over time. And so I think that kind of affiliation change is something that could potentially be addressed uh, with ORCID. Uh, or uh, with publishers um, who decide what kind of metadata to show around an article um, that they're publishing and the affiliation of uh, the, the author of that article. Um, it's kind of a publisher decision to determine uh, which affiliation of the author to display. So I hope that that addresses um, that particular question about how affiliations can change over time. Yeah, thanks, that was great. I think I do have another question uh, for you. Um, can you discuss the differences between the various identifiers? ROAR seems to show GRID, ISNI, Crossroad Funder, and Wikidata. And what's the status of ORCID research organizations? Sure, yeah, happy to do that. So, uh, as Helena kind of acknowledged at, at the beginning, you know, ROAR is not the first identifier to exist uh, for institutions, and, and we fully acknowledge that. We're trying to, um, you know, kind of solve a particular a particular problem and fill a particular niche in the scholarly communication ecosystem by building truly open um, infrastructure for organization identifiers that's driven by community needs uh, and you know truly open for the community to use and to guide over time uh, we didn't want ROAR to be duplicative <laughs> or competitive with other um, IDs that are out there. So that's why you see that ROAR IDs map to other identifiers for the organization um, when they exist. So that includes the Crossref Funder Registry, GRID, uh, Wikidata, uh, and ISNI. Um, the relationship to GRID is kind of a special one in that uh, we were lucky to be working with digital science uh, as part of the startup for the minimum viable registry uh, and use the grid data set as the starting point for ROAR. Um, so we didn't have to build the registry from scratch. And so um, that was what allowed us to get the registry up and running in January. And what we're working on now um, closely with the grid team uh, is how to build on the ROAR registry over time to support independent curation of ROAR records uh, and uh, allow, you know, allow the registry to grow and expand with community input. Um, the, it's important that ROAR map to grid IDs um, and the same is going to be true for GRID um, in their forthcoming release. Uh, my understanding is that GRID is also going to include ROAR IDs in their data set. So um, we're really committed to that kind of interoperability on both sides. Thanks. Uh, I think that probably covers all of that. Um, in the chat, there's some discussion about ORCID. There was a question about why ORCID isn't involved. I think Maria already mentioned that we are working closely with ORCID um, to ensure we make the most of both person and organization uh, identifiers. Um, it's mentioned that ORCID, the ORCID API supports start and end dates for affiliations. Um, and someone asked whether multiple simultaneous affiliations are also possible. So I think people are helping each other here. And then I think we have another question for Daniela. Um, does Dryad support multiple affiliations for the same author on a single paper? Thanks, Ted. Um, no, right now we are not. I think people could um, ask us if they wanted to add multiple, but um, in the couple of weeks of implementation now, it's been a uh, one-to-one -one relationship. But uh, we wanted to see kind of what researchers were saying um, and see if that was something that we needed to add um, after it's out there and they're using it. Okay, great. Then I think, um... We've answered all the questions in chat. Um, if you have any questions following this webinar, if you wake up tomorrow morning and you suddenly want to know more, uh, ah, I see another question coming in, so we don't have to wait until tomorrow morning. 
Let's see. I think the person is still typing. So we'll give them a couple of seconds. Um, and Adam just responded to the question about uh, the ORCID API saying that he doesn't think there's currently any check on affiliations. Um, and here we have a question. What do the units do that cannot find the autofill for the value? How do you report a missing organization? I guess that's probably also for Maria. Yeah, so if this is uh, not so much about Dryad, but just in general, if you see that there uh, is an organization that you think belongs in ROAR that you don't see in ROAR, uh, right now you can email info at ROAR.org uh, to suggest that we add it to the registry. And we're in the process of establishing a community curation board um, to review those kinds of requests going forward and um, ensure that the additions meet the, the criteria for the registry and, and so forth. So that's the best way at the moment. Um, we'll have some sort of form uh, in the future uh, that, that people can use to submit those suggestions as well. Uh, for the dryad, uh, for the, the Dryad case, if there's a missing organization when somebody is submitting to Dryad, that's going to be kind of built into the uh, into Dryad's curation process, um, as, as far as I understand it. So, as Daniela was mentioning, uh, the the Dryad curators will pass on that kind of feedback to the ROAR team to um, to say we've flagged these affiliations that researchers are entering that don't seem to be um, present in ROAR, so that we can consider adding them. Um, I think as a follow-up, I see the question, if we are members of ISNI or something else, can we go that route? So I guess some kind of mapping. Yeah, so ROAR already maps to ISNI, so I'm, I'm not sure the which route we're talking about. If, oh, if you want to submit the request to ISNI, uh, sure, <laughs> that would work. Uh, when organizations close or otherwise become defunct, change their names. Uh, so the, the ROAR IDs are, are stable and persistent. So those IDs are, are not going to change. And then uh, what we do want to do is support curation so that we can reflect those changes to organizations over time while keeping the IDs themselves uh, stable and persistent. So uh, we will, uh, you know, be determining how to, how to show uh, what changed in a record and, and, and when and perhaps why and those kinds of um, curation and provenance decisions. But with the, with the IDs themselves, we want those to be, uh, you know, obviously um, those, those won't change so that we can always have that to, um, uh, to connect to. Thanks. I just realized I actually missed a question in the Q&A, so let me ask that. Now I think it's probably for Robin, uh, based on the time uh, when it was asked. Um, is it possible to add more than one affiliation for one author when submitting metadata? I believe so, yes. Okay, good. All right. And I think that this time we've really answered all questions. Um, as I was starting to say, feel free to get in touch with Datasite, uh, with Dryad or with Roar if you have any questions about any of the things you heard today. Um, we'll be making the recording available uh, on our YouTube channel. So feel free to share it with other people that are interested in Roar. Uh, and thanks a lot for joining us today. And thanks, uh, Daniela and Robin. Uh, for your talks and Maria, Maria for stepping in and answering all these questions. Uh, it was really great to hear from all of you and uh, I hope to see everyone again uh, for the next Data Site webinar. Thanks everyone.